today, we thank you, thank you, thank you for a weekend that we can worship you and just say thank you for all that you've done in our lives. You sacrificed your life for us so that we can have life to the full and the abundant and the free. And Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity today to worship you and thank you. And thank you for the country that we live, a land that is free. And I just thank you for those who have uh, uh, given uh, the ultimate sacrifice. So today, Lord, I pray that we can remember those who have sacrificed, but also, Lord, keep our eyes on you today. So, Father, be glorified and be raised up above all else today, we pray. And everyone said?
praise this morning.
What can I say? Just come and serve us, if you will, in just a moment. We're going to enter into a prayer time of communion. You know, we serve a risen Savior. He's risen because of the sacrifice that he made. And he made that sacrifice so that we can have freedom today and tomorrow and forever. Amen. You know, to this weekend is all about uh, remembering the sacrifice of blood that was shed for a land that can be free. And the stand that our families have taken over the generations to remember the sacrifices that have been made. We're grateful for those sacrifices. We're very thankful for those sacrifices. But there's one sacrifice that rises above all sacrifices. And even though our men and our women who have sacrificed so greatly for this nation, before the server service today, I want us to be just remembering today the sacrifice that Christ gave. Because that's the sacrifice that will give freedom in your life. So today, you don't need to be a member of our church. You might be visiting with us today. We welcome you today. We want to invite you to receive communion with us. It doesn't save you, but if you are a, a believer in Christ, Today, he says, I want to have a personal relationship with you. And because of that personal relationship that I eagerly desire to have with you, what I want you to do is when you gather together as a family, 
I want you to take, and I want you to eat, and I want you to drink. And I want you to remember the sacrifice, the blood that I shed, and the body that I gave. Because I did it freely for you. So today, whether you're new to church, whether today you're watching online, I pray today that you'll be able to look at your life and just say, thank you, Jesus, for that sacrifice. When Peter sat in that upper room with Jesus in Luke, it's recorded that Peter said, is it going to be I that disowns you? And Jesus said, no, no, there is one. But Peter, it's not you. Oh, but you know, I, I've goofed up so many times, Peter. Relax, it's not you. And maybe today you're asking, Lord, I, I don't know, man. Have I goofed up? Have I, have I done something? Listen, Jesus said my sacrifice is good for everybody. And I want you to have it. So today we're going to sing. And, then, and as we sing, I'd like you to take the elements of communion and, and just hold them. And we're going to take it all together as a family today. But as we sing, will you enter a time of, of meditation and prayer? Maybe you want to sing along. Maybe you want to stand. Maybe you want to sit. I just pray right now that these next few moments that you'll remember the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice today, that the banner over our head is love because of the love that came from the cross for each of us. Let's worship the Lord. Today, as we prepare now to take and eat in this meal, 
Lord, we thank you so much for the love that you give each one. The love of forgiveness of our sins. The love that you have gone to prepare a place for us for all of eternity. And the love and the grace and the mercy you bestow on each of our lives. Father, we thank you for that. Will you take and eat and remember the sacrifice of the body that was given for you this morning. same way scripture says he took the cup and he passed it he said remember the body but also remember the blood the sacrifice the love that I freely pour we take and drink this morning and remember the sacrifice freely given freely poured for your forgiveness you're here today and uh, worshiping with us, worshiping the Lord. And if you're visiting, we do welcome you today. You could have chosen to be anywhere else, at any campground, on any lake, on any river. You could have been there, but you're not. You're here, and we thank you for that. And those of you that are watching on Facebook today, uh, we're glad you're part of us. So you, some of you I know have reception in different campgrounds, and uh, we just thank you for being with us as well today and taking time to worship. Ushers, come and help us this morning, if you would, as we worship as a church through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And I got to say thank you to you, uh, church. We, uh, we have raised uh, the cash to pay for the roof, and uh, the bill has been paid. So thank you for that. Job well done. So, uh, so we still have the parking lot part of it to go, and we're still a little short on that, but you'll give us God direct. So, Father, today, we want to continue to worship, continue to lift our hearts and our voices of praise to you. Use these gifts and these tithes and these offerings, Lord, and uh, touch it and let it touch people's lives in your name. Amen.
Wow. Hey, thank you. Um, our worship team, they put a lot of time and effort into this. Can we just give them a hand? Because they did, our kids did a great job being part of us today. Well, we have a, um, a sermon series that we are part of, and it's, it's in the book of Daniel. Uh, today we're going to take a break from that, so uh, uh, we'll pick up on that next week, and we'll pick up with the, the second pillar in that, that sermon series. But I want to bring you up to speed a little bit as a church on what our journey has been like over these last about two years. Uh, about two years ago, we started thinking and praying about the concept of life groups. And uh, having our church grow to the next level sometimes means you grow smaller to grow bigger. And your church board has uh, been praying about uh, how can we maneuver our church into uh, understanding the concept of, of journeying real life with one another. And we have had uh, different things happen over the last couple of years that have moved us into the position we are in right now and believing that God has a time and a plan and a purpose for today uh, and these days for us as a church to, to push ourselves and stretch ourselves into relationships with one another. And it just happened that even yesterday at men's breakfast, um, there were two men that uh, one was in the kitchen and one was at the serving counter, and they did not know each other. This always boggles my mind because they sit literally 15 feet apart in this section right here. And uh, they introduce themselves with a handshake, and I'm like, was that for real? Yeah, we don't know each other. It's like, seriously, sit down and eat together. And uh, it, was just, it was one of those reminders to me, like, we have got to have relationship uh, and journey together uh, for lots of different reasons. So be thinking about uh, how you can jump in in the fall to uh, Life Group. But that brings me to, we've been praying for somebody to help us uh, lead the endeavor of Life Group and to move us uh, in that way and help us along and, and kind of show us what it looks like. And um, about eight months ago or nine, uh, Aaron Johnson uh, came and uh, we, introduced, he, we introduced ourselves to each other and his wife, Sarah, uh, Sarah on the piano this morning jumped in and uh, leading us. Sarah, thank you for, for that today. And, and Aaron has a heart for ministry and he's got a passion for Jesus and today, you're going to hear a little bit from Aaron. Aaron's going to bring the word to us today. But Aaron came to me and he said, you know what? I really have longed for a church that I can be part of, that I can give back to. And uh, I said, well, let's pray about that. What's that look like? Aaron, he, he's part of the military. He, he's, uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about his job and, and what he does, a little bit of his history uh, there. And in fact, he just got back from Hawaii in his Hawaii office uh, at about 1130 last night. So I know it's a hard life. But, uh, but he's here. His eyes are barely open. Um, but uh, he'll share a little bit with us today on, on what he does as a career. But part of his, his career is he's taken seminary classes at Liberty University. And he's only got 10 more classes to go. And six of those 10 are Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> he saved the best to last, you know. So, Sarah, you pray a lot for your man, okay? Because pray for you, too, because you're going to need it. <laughs> Get through that. Woo! Let me tell you. But, uh, but Aaron has a, 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 a feeling in his heart that God's saying, uh, Aaron, I need you to step up. I need, I need you to lead in a different way and leading in the church. And what does that look like? So Aaron and I, we started a conversation and uh, along the lines of, hey, come on board as a, an intern here at our church and give ministry a try. Lead where God wants you to go and lead how God wants you to lead and, uh, and, and bring us along on the journey that God has placed on your heart. And uh, so Aaron has agreed, and Sarah, both, I assume, uh, have agreed, that uh, Aaron's going to come on as our intern here uh, in ministry. I uh, don't know for how long that'll be. It might be for a year. It might be for a couple years. It might be just for this week. We'll see how the day goes, okay? Um, but, uh, but he's going to come and bring the word to us today. His focus for us as a church is he's going to be the director of life groups, so he might be contacting you, and he might be saying, hey, you know what? Have you ever thought to lead? Have you ever thought to be part of? Have you ever thought about this ministry at all? And uh, Aaron, I've just come to love him and his leadership style and how he has put this, this uh, concept together on paper and on a dry erase board because I know it comes from his heart. We sat at Starbucks several times over coffee because we both have that in common besides Jesus. 
And, uh, and I said, Aaron, pray about what it is that you think you want to come on as an intern. And he, he came back. And I thought he was going to come back with something different. He came back and said, well, I really think life groups, Pastor. And I said, well, man, that cannot be that easy, can it? And I looked up at the ceiling there in Starbucks, and I was like, Lord, you got to stop messing with my life right now because this has been a long prayer and a long time in coming. And uh, so that's where we are on the journey with Aaron. And if you have not met Aaron and Sarah yet, uh, I'd like you to just to stop by and see them today on, on your way out. And I haven't asked you guys to do this, but I'm going to ask you right now in front of everybody because now you can't say no, okay? But if you guys just kind of be back over here in the connections area uh, after service and uh, people, you go over and you just shake hands and uh, get to know them. You'll fall in love with them this morning in a great way. So, um, but Aaron, come. Will you give Aaron a hand as he comes and uh, breaks open the word to us today? We're going to pray for your brother because this is a good looking group and, uh, and, they, and they are going to be your friends here in the next few minutes. And judgment comes next Sunday, right? Okay, we'll see. We'll see how this week goes. Just no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Father, today we thank you for uh, our man Aaron, and uh, we thank you for him being your guide today to break open the word. We thank you, Lord, for him being able to uh, find a direction and a path in his heart to say yes to you. And because of that yes, Lord, had taken this step as an intern, as coming on and ministering in different ways, whether it's with life groups or if it's teaching or if it's like today preaching. Lord, I pray today that you would just have your hand of special blessing in his life today. We thank you for him and his ministry. Remove him now, Lord, and uh, let your word be the word and bigger than anything that he could ever dream up. So, Lord, we're excited today to hear what you have to use uh, and say through your man today, Aaron, your name. Amen. All right. Um, you know, when you start seminary, you have to ask the question, what kind of pastor, what kind of minister are you going to be? And you start paying attention to the ones that are in front of you, and you learn from each one. And uh, Pastor Eric is the king of the object lesson. If anybody was here for Christmas and saw his Christmas suit, you know what I mean. We've got the pillars up here, and so uh, I just wanted, in the spirit of, of Eric's style, I wanted to make sure that I had something up here for the, the object lesson. <laughs> um, to this morning, we're going to look at Hebrews. Um, we're going to specifically be in chapter 11, verses 32, and we're going to go all the way to chapter 12, verses, verse 4. Um, I've gotten some feedback from some other pastors, and, and many of them have already said, Aaron, you tend to bite off more than you can chew. So the bad news is we might be here a little bit longer than you had anticipated. The good news is I'm really nervous, and when I'm nervous, I talk really fast, and so we could be out of here in about three minutes. <laughs> um. Spurgeon says, um, when he's evaluating his students, he says, when I see a sermon that includes a whole bunch of introductory matter, I start to get worried because I'm looking for the weightier part of the sermon. But what we're going to talk about today is near and dear to my heart, and my history actually is um, why I'm, I, I think I'm, I'm qualified today to talk about what it is that we're going to talk about today. I grew up in Hermiston, went to Western, or West Park Elementary School. Um, in fact, at the men's breakfast, we were talking about a church across the street, and I remember that church had um, asphalt shingles that had fallen off, and I remember as a kid picking those up, breaking them off, and throwing them at one another until some one of, one of my friends got hit in the forehead, and uh, head wounds bleed. I learned that young. Um, and so I grew up in this area. I went to uh, Hermiston High School, um, the middle school here in town. Um, my parents both went back to college to get an education degree, and so between my um, sophomore and junior year, I actually, we moved to Umatilla where they got hired, um, and I finally graduated from, from Umatilla High School in 1993. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up, and so um, I was trying to decide, do I go to college, do I take some time off? The school offered three scholarships, one for athletics, that wasn't me, I played football, but I was a 100 pound senior, so I didn't really contribute to the team that much. They had another one for academics, um, and that wasn't me. I, I've always been a bright kid, but I, I get distracted easily, and so my GPA was never very good. But they had a third one, and that was just for, um, for giving to somebody who the, the, the administration thought might need some help, and so they offered that one to me. And I'm so grateful that they did, because um, I couldn't put off going to college, so I went to Blue Mountain Community College. After I got my associate's degree, I, went to, um, I enlisted in the Oregon Army National Guard. In fact, I enlisted in what is now a flower shop here in town. 
Um, and, and later, I would command another company in the Oregon National Guard, and, and it, it, had a, it rivaled the company here in Hermiston, and I loved to point out to that company commander that, hey, at least my old armory isn't a flower shop. <laughs> but I enlisted into that flower shop. Then I went to Western Oregon, I went to basic training in AIT, and while I was at basic training, I thought, heck with this, I'm going back to college, the Army is hard. Went to Western Oregon University, got my law enforcement degree, came back to Eastern Oregon, where I was a police officer in Stanfield. That was when I met my wife. No, we didn't interact professionally. <laughs> I actually met her at a young adult's Bible study in, um, in Pendleton. And then I got hired at the Pendleton Police Department, um, and then in 2005, oh, and after I graduated, I became a lieutenant in the Oregon Army National Guard with a, with a specialty in military intelligence. Um, in 2005, well, <laughs> I asked my wife to marry me before that, and I remember she said, well, what about Iraq? And I said, oh, we're an armor battalion. It'd have to be really bad over there for them to send us. So I asked her to marry me. She said yes, and six months later, I'm like, uh, Sarah... Um, I think they're going to send me to Iraq. The joke was that Sergeant Jennings and Lieutenant Johnson had spent more time together than Lieutenant Johnson and his wife. And uh, I'm so grateful that, that we survived that time. I came back. Um, the Army said, hey, do you want to teach military intelligence? I said, yes. Went to my wife and said, we're going to move to Arizona. And to my astonishment, she said, okay. We packed everything into a U-Haul. We drove down to, to Arizona. When we got to a Wachuca City, she cried, where, where have you brought me? <laughs> Fortunately, that wasn't where we were stopping. We kept driving and found a little bit better community. Um, and I taught basic analysis at Fort Wachuca for a little while. And uh, my mentor kept asking me, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? You need a master's degree. You need a master's degree. And I narrowed it down. History, education or seminary, and I ruled out every one of them but seminary. I was talking to a buddy of mine who deployed with me. He's now an FBI agent in Spokane. I said, Marjo, I'm going to be a, I'm going to go to seminary, and he said, why? And I said, Marjo, at the second coming, you and I are both out of work. He's not going to need police. He's not going to need soldiers. <laughs> I deployed twice with the Oregon National Guard to Iraq, once in 2005, once in 2010. I commanded Charlie Company. It was the highlight of my career. I would do that over and over and over again if they would let me. One of my favorite days. I have a twin brother. We're both firearms enthusiasts, and I remember it. My birthday is usually in the field because annual training is in the summer, and my birthday is in the summer. And I was standing on my tank. And I called my brother on the cell phone, and I said, Jason, happy birthday. What are you doing today? So, you know, birthday cake. Waiting for him to say, what are you doing today? He said, what are you doing today, Aaron? And I said, well, I'm standing on top of a 120-millimeter cannon and three machine guns, <laughs> waiting for my turn to knock down a target that's going to run across the desert. It's going to be awesome. Then I went to seminary. And let me tell you, um, I, think, I think my seminary professors understand me, but my, my fellow students don't get me. And now Pastor Eric has got me on an internship to lead life groups. I hope you guys know. I have no idea how this is going to turn out. <laughs> so let's look at Hebrews this morning, shall we? We bow your heads in prayer. Jesus, you are without blemish, the burnt offering presented on our behalf of the Father's free will. I confess that I deserve to die, acknowledging that this death has been transferred to you. Your blood was poured out and your life completely consumed for my sin. You are required because I'm not enough. Right now I place my hand upon your head for, for my sin and know that you counted among those transferred to you on Calvary. Forgive me and thank you. In response, I offer myself made sinless to you. All of me and everything that I own are now yours. I stand equal among your elect, ready to do your work, whatever it may be. Every morning, every evening, and every moment in between are yours. You've set a place for me at your table. The bread you offer is your son. The best and perfect parts of him were made a sacrifice for me. Lord, give me the peace of your table, the peace that brings your elect into communion by the Holy Spirit through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, today is a huge honor to stand before your body of believers with the task of presenting your word. 
there are men and women here who have hearts for you. Lord, I have completed my work and prepared it as an offering to you. Please accept this offering, anoint it with your spirit, and use it for your purposes. Move me out of your way and prepare our hearts to receive what it is you would have us to learn this morning. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we read today's passage. Hebrews 11, starting at verse 32. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, for put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility again against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. This is the word of the Lord, and we are thankful for it. Please be seated. Hebrews 11 has been a theme of my life for probably the last two years. Consistently, I come back and come back and come back to Hebrews 11 for encouragement. And I love this passage because it starts with the phrase, and what more shall I say? It's a rhetorical question. What needs to be said? These are the examples of our faith. The writer doesn't need to embellish. The faithful in the hall of faith are our examples. As an intelligence officer, we would, I would receive awards. And my job was to scrub those recommendations and make sure that none of, none of the information in them was classified so that we could send them forward and get them approved to, to give the soldier the award. And so I read through all of these awards. And one day I came across a soldier, it's a young man, maybe 18, 19 years old. His job was to man a gun in the top of a Humvee for security as the convoy was moving through Iraq. We had a road that did not have the most explosive incidents on it, but when it had an explosive incident, it had a big one. And so we we were responsible for one of the dangerous portions of Iraq. And one day he was in the lead vehicle of his convoy as they were driving through and an IED exploded underneath his vehicle. The force of the explosion was so great that it threw him a hundred feet and he landed on his back in the dirty desert. He got up, didn't even have time to dust himself off. His concern was for the other people in that vehicle. He ran back to the vehicle and he started doing first aid on those soldiers. Medics were brought forward, and as those medics took control of the the medical situation, he got back up, he looked around, and he realized that they they still hadn't set the security around the convoy. So he goes back to the third vehicle now, he jumps in and takes the position on that gun, and he's directing that vehicle through the danger zone to the other side so that he can establish security. There were two IEDs that day, and the second one blew up on his vehicle again threw him another hundred feet. He got up, and again, without even dusting himself off, he ran back. He started doing first aid on the vehicle. Or not on the vehicle, but the soldiers in the vehicle. We did first aid on the vehicle later. (laughs) What more do I say? I don't have to tell you of his commitment. The story of his actions, tell tell the story of his commitment. His faithfulness was seen. Let me tell you of a sergeant major. I don't know if you guys have seen We Were Soldiers. If you haven't, it's a great movie. Don't take your kids to it yet. 
But there's a sergeant major in that movie, Sergeant Major Plumley, based off of a real-life sergeant major in Vietnam. We had a sergeant major that was, they had to be brothers. We were training one day, and when you get out of your Humvee, you have to look for those IEDs. And in the process of doing so, I moved my weapon and I actually flagged my sergeant major. I pointed the barrel at the sergeant major, at which point he came over and kicked me in the chest. I flew up against my Humvee and he said, don't ever flag me again, lieutenant. I said, roger that, sergeant major. I watched as we got ready to deploy, he went through medical review board after medical review board. Every challenge that was thrown in front of him he met and overcame. And one day I asked him, I said, Sergeant Major, you served in Vietnam. When you tell stories that start with, so there I was, knee deep in hand grenade pins, we believe you. You've done your part. Nobody would think any less of you if you sat this one out. And he said, in Vietnam, we faced dark days. And I knew dark days were coming, but I didn't know how dark they were going to be. What got us through those dark days were the old timers. I'm now an old timer and these soldiers are going to be facing dark days. It's my time to be the old timer. What more do I say? What more shall I say? Tomorrow we're going to celebrate Memorial Day. It's a day of remembrance for those who have fallen in battle. And it's different than Veterans Day because on Veterans Day we celebrate all veterans, but on Memorial Day we celebrate those who have fallen. I'm going to tell stories about those who have fallen. I'm going to tell stories about veterans, and I mean no disrespect. But the heart of the soldier, the heart of the veteran, and the heart of the one who gives his life are the same. And so I think it's going to shed some light on what the writer of Hebrews is telling us about. The stories that we're going to remember tomorrow are too numerous. We don't have time to cover them all. The writer of Hebrews had the same problem. So the heart of the soldier. Jonathan Rabb, writing for the New York Times, asks the question, why does anyone want to go back to IEDs, rockets, machine guns, explosions in the middle of the night, long hours, brutal desert sun, icy winter winds, long marches under heavy packs, endless hours of tedium, boredom, pointless work details, angry locals, children with outstretched hands, begging for pens or water, crappy food, no support, sand in every crevice, overbearing officers, fragos, messed up paperwork, ambiguous letters from loved ones, poor leadership, missed birthdays, missed graduation, missed parties, lost jobs, failed businesses, lost opportunity, broken hearts, unemployment, alcoholism, and depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. When faced with the choice of deploying again or to go out and live a comparably soft civilian life with all the comforts Western civilization and its opulence has to offer, why does a veteran choose to go back? Jonathan's question reads just like our passage. If we look at 34 through 38, we find escape to the edge of the sword. We find torture, refusing to accept release, suffering, mocking, and flogging, chains, and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawn in two, killed by the sword, went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, wandering about in desert and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. The challenges are the same. The risks are the same. Service, more specifically faithful service, whether we're serving in the military or we're serving our Lord, comes with hardship and trials. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, in his commentary on Hebrews, says, Faith is associated with trials. It is natural for faith to be tested. Since it is natural for faith to be tested, trials should not nullify faith. Trials should strengthen faith, for trials bring more faith. And I'm not even talking about being rescued from the trial. Pastor Eric's working on a passage, working his way through Daniel's, and we talk, we're going to talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we might have, I might have missed it already because I was gone, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, our God can save us from the fiery furnace, but even if he doesn't, we will continue to serve him. Our veterans know that this is true. Hardship produces faith. 
you will hear them say, this sucks. <laughs> I love how much this sucks. We need to embrace the suck. And if you want to know who you can rely on, just wait for the times to get tough. Those tough times prove our faith. A good friend of mine enlisted at the same time as I did, enlisted into the same flower shop even. <laughs> he got to MEPS for his medical review and he was disqualified and was never able to serve. He and I are still friends. In fact, I had him helping me with, the, um, with some garage work just the other day. And he tells me over and over and over again how much he wishes he could serve and how he would have served well. And I don't doubt his sincerity, but I have friends that I have served with, that I have served through hard times, and I know their sincerity. That's the difference, and that, only, that difference only comes with trials and hardship. Those who paid the ultimate price are an extension of this to its logical conclusion. One last comment on verse 38. On that specific little phrase, the world is not worthy. Let me tell you about Sergeant Augie, Ogburn. I got to interview Sergeant Augie for his security clearance. He wasn't married. He had a sister with three kids, and he was working two jobs so that he could help his sister support those kids. She was a single mom. He even told me that he was working so hard that he probably would never get married. He just didn't have time to date. He was also in the guard, and we were preparing for a deployment, and he showed up for drill weekend one day, and he had gone to McDonald's and got himself a McMuffin. But when he was walking into the armory, he didn't have enough room to carry his McMuffin, so he left it on the car next to his. Intending to come back to it, he walks into the armory, and he gets distracted. Captain Cotts, now Lieutenant Colonel Cotts, comes into the armory, and he's bearing the burden of the deployment and the leadership and preparing, and he's exhausted. He's married and has four kids, and as he pulls into the parking lot, he sees that McMuffin, and he didn't have time. So he grabbed that McMuffin, and he thought, I'm so grateful for my wife. She's not going to have time to bring this into me, but in the process of getting the kids ready and out the door for school, she dropped a McMuffin off, and he eats the McMuffin. Later, Augie goes out in the parking lot, sees that the McMuffin's not there, and just assumes that he must have ate it and forgot. That's the level at which we're operating here. You do forget to eat or forget that you have eaten. So he goes back to work. In fact, he even mentions it to Captain Cotts. He says, sir, I was so... I just forgot that I had eaten my McMuffin. <laughs> Captain Cotts puts two and two together. Says, sorry, man, I ate your McMuffin. <laughs> but at that moment, they both realized that they did need to find some quiet time. And often they would be found sitting together at dinner, eating together, and just talking about what was going on in their family's lives. Augie didn't make it back. And the world's not worthy. Christians, know whether it's the people in the hall of faith or it's the soldiers who have died ahead of us, they went and their faith was proven through that trial. The trials that we find ourselves in should prove our faith as well. Looking back at Hebrews 39 and 40, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from them, they should not be made perfect. Here's the conclusion to the hall of faith. God made them a promise that they believed. That's why they were faithful. They believed the promise. But they didn't know how that promise was going to be fulfilled. Peter, in 1 Peter, says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what persons or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating 
when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into, into which angels long to look. Our Old Testament heroes did not know how God was going to bring about the promises that he had given them. And yet they were still faithful to those promises to the point of being sawn in half. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, speaking of God's glories, Christ is speaking of his resurrection, his ascension, his resumption of glory, his enthronement at the right hand of God the Father, his second coming, and his millennial reign. Peter points out that although the Holy Spirit indwelling the prophets, indwelled the prophets, their knowledge was nonetheless still limited. Not only did the faithful listed in Hebrews not receive the promise, but they, didn't quite, they couldn't possibly understand what, how God was going to go about fulfilling those promises. Christians, you and I know how God worked out our salvation. We don't know what that means in the, in the glory to come. Something better was coming in the good news of the gospel. We've been given white robes. Next. Revelations. Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. While John is speaking of the revel of, uh, while John is speaking of martyrs, that rest is also promised to you and I. And it's that promise of that rest that we look forward to. I see a lot of kids out here. How many parents are looking forward to rest? That's the promise that was given to us. Know that the Old Testament faithful endured because they believed in the promise. We have to endure even when we don't see how God is going to fulfill His promises. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne. Therefore means now what? Jesus is the perfecter of our faith. the faithful of the Old Testament, they were used so that when Jesus went to the cross and when Jesus died for your sins, we wouldn't miss it. All of the Old Testament prophesied to who Jesus was, and yet as they were searching the Scripture, they couldn't quite see it, and we wouldn't have seen it either. But as soon as Jesus came and did it, it was like a neon sign was turned on. Had the Old Testament faithful not been faithful, we would have missed it. But like the Old Testament faithful, we don't know what glory awaits us. We do know that we've been given a promise of glory. We need to be faithful in the midst of that promise. Hebrews 12, 2 also says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. You and I are in need of salvation. Jesus was not. Jesus didn't need to be saved. He was already perfect. He was already complete. John, 
17.5 says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus already had that glory. And yet, he was faithful to the cross. For the joy that was set before him, What was that joy? Here's here's the secret of all of creation. You are that joy. Jesus went to the cross for the joy that was sent before him. Your salvation was the joy that was set before him. There's three parts to that passage, though. Jesus despised the shame. He went to the cross, despising the shame for the joy. I'm off my notes a little. I think it's because I'm tired. How many of you have been hurt? How many of you have been stabbed in the back by Christians, by family, by fellow believers? I have. I will be again. And I despised them for it. That's not necessarily wrong, but we have to set that aside and continue to do what it is that God has asked us to do. Jesus, when he prayed in the garden, swept drops of blood. Lord, this is going to suck. If you can do something else, please do something else. And yet he was faithful. Jesus was faithful. Despising the shame that we put on him, the centurion that whipped, mocked, haggled over his clothing, I just imagine Jesus looking down on him, despising what he was doing. And yet what Jesus was doing was all about him. At some point, the centurion came to the realization that surely this must be the Son of God. And it doesn't clearly say that that centurion was saved. But if he was, imagine the joy that Jesus experienced. He did that for that. Once you accept this, this is the truth of all reality. This is why God has not destroyed creation. It's because He loves you. Otherwise, we are in, we deserve it. The judgment would come and we would be destroyed. And God, in His power, could start all over again. But He didn't. He went to the cross to redeem you because you are His joy. Now, many of you have already accepted this. I, too, have accepted this. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And you know what is really changing my life right now? Is the realization that now, while all of that was about me, Jesus went to the cross for me. As soon as I accept that, it's not about me anymore. We are now to endure for His joy, which is our joy. We are to be His hands and His feet. But how do we experience that joy? Look around. I don't like all of you. (laughs) And many of you aren't going to like me. (laughs) Just wait. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, thanks, Patty. Several winters ago, I watched as a good friend of mine, he was a soldier who served under me, and his wife left him. 
just before Christmas. They had five kids together. She took four of them, the oldest one stayed, and she went to her family. I prayed with him. I didn't know what else to do. I asked him, is she a godly woman? And he told me that she was. And I said, then whatever you do, it can't jeopardize her return. And we prayed. And I watched as he struggled, woke up on Christmas morning, the presents were unwrapped. She went away and she finally came back. And when, she, when he asked her, why did you return? She said, I didn't want what the world was offering me. I'm married to a man of God who believes that his job is to sacrifice for me. His oldest son watched as he struggled through that period and watched as his mom came back and because of his father's faithfulness accepted Jesus as his Savior. When all of this was done, I asked him, He's got four more kids that all need saving. Would he go through it again for each one of them? And he said, yes. That's the joy that is set before us. It's the same joy that is set before Jesus. I'm way off my notes now. Let's bring this back to Memorial Day, shall we? no longer about us. On September 1st, 1968, Lieutenant Colonel Williams Jones III led three A-1 Sandys on a search and rescue mission over northwest of Dong Hoi over North Vietnam. Jones and his wingman, Captain Paul A. Meeks, were searching for a downed fighter pilot while destroying enemy guns and escorting helicopters for the pickup. When the weather worsened, worsened, Jones led his wingman lower across the rugged hills that arose abruptly from the valley floor. Without warning, his plane was rocked by a violent explosion, his cockpit filled with smoke. When the smoke cleared, it did not appear as if his plane had been badly damaged, and he knew that time was important as the enemy was bringing in more forces. Making pass after pass, the downed pilot finally radioed that Jones was right on top of his position. Just then, an anti-aircraft gun opened up with a barrage of fire from a nearby hill. Bringing his plane back around, Jones engaged the gun. On his second pass, the rocket motor for his ejection mechanism was ignited by an exploding shell, and he could see fire coming out of the rear of his plane. His instrument panel was clouded with smoke. Fire seemed to burst out from everywhere. Jones knew he had to get out. He reached down and grabbed the extraction handle and pulled. When the canopy blew off, he waited for the ejection, but nothing happened. When his canopy was jettisoned, the fresh air increased the intensity of the fire, and the strap that fastened his oxygen mask was burned through, exposing his face to searing flames, and his hands were badly burned. Most of his instruments were unreadable, and the cockpit was a smoldering shambles. Despite his pain, Jones tried desperately to broadcast the exact position of the downed pilot. Captain Meeks joined him, aircraft to aircraft, as Jones fought desperately. As his eyes began to swell shut, he fought to return to Thailand so that he could report the position of that downed pilot. Despite his mangled hand and blurred vision, Jones managed to make it back, and Meeks guided him down to a perfect landing. Colonel Leonard Bollet reached the gutted aircraft first. He could not believe what he saw. Everything was burned to a crisp, including Jones' helmet, oxygen mask, survival vest, neck, and arms. Yet Jones kept flailing about in his cockpit, looking for his maps as he was lifted out. He refused medical intention until he was satisfied that they knew the exact location of the downed pilot's position. Jones continued to debrief the intelligence officer as he lay on the operating table. The downed pilot was rescued. Jones died. He was given a posthumous medal of honor. Jones died not because he knew that there was something more, but because he loved that downed pilot. Jesus died, not for his glory, but because he loves you. Today, Christians, you are either lost and in desperate need of a Savior, 
or you're desperately seeking to deliver the message to the lost. Or you're alongside those who are desperately singing, trying to help them. That's the connection between those who died for our freedom and Jesus who died for our salvation. It's the love that we have for one another. In all honesty, and speaking statistically, there's a good chance that none of us are going to experience the death of the battlefield. But we carry, car, we carry scars and hurts that would make veteran-hardened soldiers cry. all of which we should despise, and all of which we should be angry for. But I want to be the pilot who screams into the landing, completely spent, motivated by love for the people that I'm spending myself for. So I've lost track of where I am in my notes. Three points that I wanted to make. The faithful were faithful in the midst of their trial. Not only were they faithful in the midst of their trial, but that trial proved their faith. <laughs> I've got friends <laughs> who would say, Aaron, I'm so glad you were with me through that. And they know that I was faithful. I'm not going to go back. <laughs> but those trials proved our veterans' faith. They proved the ones we're going to remember their faith. Second point, they were faithful because they believed the promise. Do you believe the promise? Third, and this is the greatest truth in all of creation, it's that you're the joy that was set before him. It's his love for you that made him faithful to the cross. And finally, as we endure our trials, let's consider Jesus. He despised the shame, and yet he was still faithful to what his father was calling him to. So my object lesson, I'm going to leave you guys with this. Please stand. Let's, let's, let's close this thing. Look around. Look around. We are soldiers of the cross. Timothy says, soldier on. As good soldiers. Aren't we a ragtag looking crew? These are the soldiers, look around, these are the soldiers that God has given us today to fight today's fights. I was walking through the airport one day carrying my cavalry hat, because if you're not cavalry, you're just not. <laughs> and you don't bend this hat, so you don't put it in your luggage, and I'm carrying it through the airport, and I'm in a hurry because I've got to get to the next gate. And next thing I know, right beside me is a TSI agent matching me step for step. I'm looking at him. He's looking at me. I'm looking at him. He's looking at me. And he says, son, because I was younger back then, <laughs> son, I hope when you signed up that you remembered God loves the infantry. And I looked right at him and I said, God might love the infantry. But his second coming, that promise that we, prom that we believe, his second coming is coming at the head of a cavalry charge. <laughs> the question I have for you, soldiers, 
is how much are we going to spend? When I complained in the battlefield, and believe me, I did. You're hot, you're hungry. But it was the remembrance of Augie that kept me going. The faith of those people ahead of us will keep us going. And if we do it right, our faith will keep the next generation going. All right, I will see you guys at the front. Why don't you just take a seat for a moment because we want to follow what Aaron just said with some pictures of those of you who have served uh, in that same attitude of letting the next generation have freedom. So we have, I don't know, five or six pictures. So just look at these handsome, man. I'm just telling you. Check that out. Frank. Frank never looks so good, right? Father, today we thank you so much for giving us a challenge today from your word to go and be your soldiers so that other generations that come behind us, they will know the truth, they will know the legacy of the cross. We love you, Lord, in your name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Enjoy your day off. We'll see you next Sunday. Stop back there and see Aaron and Sarah, if you will. Greet them.